Okay, um, we'll get started. Hopefully, if uh, other people join, they'll be able to catch up. Um, welcome to the second session on um, how to learn Gemara. Um, if you're joining us for the second session, I hope you had a chance to watch the rec recording of the first one. Um, I'm going to do a very quick, um, um, somewhat clear enough and hopefully interesting enough as we go along. The purpose of what we're trying to do here is present a way of modeling the way expert learners learn Gemara um, with the goal of being able to teach the, the steps that an expert learner does um, to somebody who is not necessarily an expert and allow them to develop the same skills that somebody who is an expert can do. Um, as we said last time, um, we're focusing on the halachic parts of the Gemara. Um, Agatha takes a different um, set of skills, um, and we define the halachic parts of the Gemara as the um, parts of the Gemara that, um, that in their bottom line, deal with one of these six, uh, these six topics. Um, we said that halacha is basically a legal system and mimicking the uh, modern legal systems, um, which we define as either statutory law or case law. Um, the Gemara is presenting statutory law, a rule-based system, um, but very often using the presentation style of case law, presenting you cases and um, adjudications of those cases. And um, through that, trying to develop and show you the, uh, the statutes that are involved in halacha. Um, we said one, one of the problems for somebody who learns Gemara is that there are actually a number of different skill sets that are necessary in order to um, learn Gemara well, um, starting with analytic thinking. You need to have reading comprehension. Um, a good memory is definitely helpful. And to be able to organize topics, um, the first uh, presentation was um, completely dedicated towards the analytic thinking. Um, today, we're going to continue with that primarily, um, but also touch on reading comprehension. Um, we presented a series of steps of how to analyze a particular case and its din. Um, and we went through these steps for the very first talacha in the first Mishnah in, uh, in Moed Katan. Um, I'm not going to go through it again, but basically we identified this text and um, we went through the process of identifying what the din type was. It was a din of mutter, what the halachic act was, and then through a series of questions identified the input conditions that... Um, a series of questions that identify the input conditions or the circumstances under which this act will have that din. Um, once we identified those input conditions, we were able to focus on which were the um, which which were the significant input conditions, which were the ones that generated the the halacha. And then we generalized those particular um, input conditions to create the rule instead of just the ruling um, that identifies the, um, the statute that's hiding behind this case. Um, in this case, we identified a rule of its mutter to do malacha on cholamoe um, if this is something that is a double aved and you don't have any tircha. Now I'd like to 
move on to a slightly more complicated example. I want to apply the same process to the Gemara and Moed in uh, Makos. Um, if you downloaded the uh, handout, um, you have a, a printed page with the parts of Gemara that I'm going to focus on um, uh, highlighted. Um, rather than do it on the DAF itself, um, we're going to go through the process and read through the Gemara piece by piece. So we're going to start with the Mishnah. The Mishnah starts with Hazorik Evan Lerishus Harabim Baharag Hareze Gole. Someone who throws a rock from um, their property into the public domain and causes someone to die, that is a, a, a case in which the person needs to go to Gullus. Um, we talked about identifying the text. The text is identified as the, the, a single halacha. In this case, the Mishnah is presenting the case and its adjudication. The case is Hazare Geven Lerishus Harabim Vaharag. The adjudication is Hareze Gole. The second step in the process is tell us the story. What's the story that led us to discuss this particular uh, ruling? So in our case, once upon a time, there was a guy named Ruvain, woke up in the morning, walked out of his house, um, saw this big rock that was sitting in the middle of, of his yard, picked it up, threw it over his shoulder, it landed in uh, the, the nearby street and there was somebody walking by, it landed on that person and Rahman al-Islam, the person was killed. Along came the police, they grabbed Ruvain and brought him to court and the court said, okay, Ruvain, you've got to go to Gullus. Now that we've told the story, we want to know what type of din is represented by this ruling. So I'm going to pose the question to you. Remember the din type is one of those six terms, mutter asr, chayiv pater, kasher, pasal. In our case, what would you suggest is the din type that is um, being adjudicated? Okay, well, if everybody's being shy about it. Um, Can we see the options again? You have, you have the options of Mutter oh. Asr, Chayiv Patr, Kasher, Pasal. We want to identify when this case was adjudicated, which din type was chosen. I think Patr. Oh, wait, no. If someone throws a rock into Rishus Harabim and causes um, someone to be killed, Hare Ze Gole. Hare Ze Gole, which din type would you pick? You know, feel, feel free to, to make a wild guess. And it's, not, uh, it's, it's not a test you're being uh, graded on. Have a, maybe you could put up the options again. Sure. Let's go back here. Here you go. Mutter Asr, Chayiv Patr, Kasher or Pasal. In the case in Moed um, Katan, we said that this is, this was a, a din type of Mutter. In our case here, with the dearly departed, um, We'll go, we're, we're asking what type of din it is. Um, Abba, uh, writing in the, in the chat, if you could open up your chat for a minute. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't have my chat open. Um, chat. I would think Chai of Pater. Okay, um, so, uh, Mendel, you're suggesting Chayev, this, this person is Chayev Gullus. 
And that's a very obvious um, choice for, uh, for somebody to, to say. Um, in, in reality though, um, anytime you're, you're presented with chayev or patur or mutter or asr, you have to ask yourself, is this Mishnah or this Halacha telling me that there is such a chiyuv? Or is this Mishnah telling me that this is an example that has that chiyuv? The difference is, if I say that this Mishnah is telling me there is such a chiyuv, then the din type is chayuv. But if this is telling me this is an example of a chiyuv, that tells me that I already know oh. there is such a din of chayev, and the chiddush here, what's being taught here, is that this example also fulfills those requirements. <clears throat> now, if anybody had learned the previous Mishnah in, in Makos, the previous Mishnah starts off with Elu hein hagolin ha-horeg nefesh bishkaga, that and the, who are the people who go to Gullus? Somebody who um, kills Bishoge. So based on the fact that we have such a Mishnah, we already know that there is such a din as being high of Gullus. And even without having known that Mishnah, the fact that the Mishnah here is describing a very particular case will indicate to us that what the Mishnah is trying to get across is the chiddush about this case and not necessarily the underlying chiyuv. So in our case, I'm going to say that the din here is a din of kasher. Um, hopefully that's, that's uh, acceptable. Now the next step is, what is the halachic act or what is kasher? What has been done that is kasher um, that is being ruled on. So the act that's described in the, in the Mishnah is one of Zorik, he's throwing. But we're not saying that he had a good arm. It's not that his, he did a good job of throwing. What is kasher here is the act of killing or the horeg bishogeg. Uh, which in which in English I would call manslaughter. So the the act that is being done here is one of hariga, and if it's a kasher act of hariga, then anybody, as the Mishnah said, anybody who is horig b'shogeg ha, has a requirement of going to Gullus. Okay, so now that we have that. We want to know under what circumstances is the Mishnah telling us that this is a kasher hariga. So we go through our list of questions, right? Who, who did the act of hariga? Well, it doesn't say. It could be anyone, someone, right? How did he do the act of hariga? He threw. With what did he do the act of Hariga? Well, he threw a rock. To whom did he do the act of Hariga? Some other person, not necessarily specified. Where did he do the act of Hariga? In Rishos Harabim. When did he do the act of Hariga? Doesn't say. And finally, what are the consequences of his act? Well, again, in this case, this is, these are physical consequences. Unfortunately, the poor man died. So that's the physical consequences of this act. Um, we have our placeholder. Are there, are there any other uh, circumstances that need to be captured here? Um, but I think we've done a good job. We don't have any other circumstances that we need to capture at this point. The next step in the process is to identify which are the relevant input conditions, which of these conditions are generating this halacha. 
if we remove all of the conditions that aren't explicitly stated in the Mishnah, we are left with, I think we did a good job of capturing, Hazorek Even Lurishus Harabim. The Harag is, this is a Kosher Hariga, and as a Kosher Hariga, the person would be Chayiv Galus. Next question. So what's the Chiddush? What are they telling me? If the previous Mishnah already told me that a Horeg Bishogeg is, um, is Chayiv Galus, what is added by this, the Mishnah giving us this particular case? So the first thing we want to do is find another case where the din would be not this way. Well, if in this case it's kasher, I'm looking for a pasal hariga, where if somebody did it, it would not be considered horeg bishoge. Can somebody give me a suggestion as to what would cause the uh, this not to be considered horeg bishoge? Did it intentionally. Very good. So if I would change my input condition to a particular individual, if I threw a rock at someone, well, then it's obviously not a case of manslaughter. That's already a case of murder. Case of murder is not kasher. It's puzzle as horeg bishogeg. So what is the... Um, the svara. What is the generalization that we can bring to to this case? What is the uh, statute that is being uh, embodied by this case at this point? So I would summarize as imlohit kavanta adam If you had no intention to kill a particular person, atanechshav horeg bishogeg. You're considered a Horeg Bishogeg, and any Horeg Bishogeg has to go to Galut. Okay, so we've now analyzed the case and din as presented by the Mishnah. And the next step I would like to do is to continue on to the Gemara. The Gemara starts off, L'Rishut HaRabim Mezidhu. I'd like to take a minute now before we continue on in the Gemara, as this is the first time that we're dealing with the Gemara text, to talk about um, reading comprehension. There are a number of very basic points to somebody who reads Gemara well that seem, seem obvious. Um, to someone who has trouble reading Gemara, if you can capture these points, um, it will definitely make reading the Gemara much easier. First of all, there are five different types of statements in, in the Gemara. What do I mean by statements? Well, first of all, there's a halachic statement. That's what we've been dealing with until now. Um, so we won't spend very much more time on that. There are questions that are asked. Within questions, there are many different types of questions. If you downloaded the, uh, the link to the handout, um, we have a list of, different, of 11 different types of questions that you could ask, or that the Gemara asks at different times. Um, but I'm not gonna go into the details of those. That's one of the things that um, we're working on in terms of the um, reading comprehension unit. For each of those types of questions, there's a, there's a corresponding answer, right? If you, ask a, if you ask a question, you have to be able to give an answer. There's also an assertion. The Gemara will sometimes make a statement, which is in essence the answer to an unstated question. For example, one of the types of questions is mi um, bal hamemra. Who is the author of this statement? And the Gemara will sometimes ask the question, man tana, which is explicitly asking who is the Tana of our Mishnah, and answer something like Rabbi Yehudahi. So that's an answer to the question. Alternative, alternatively, the Gemara will often state something like 
matnitin delo kerebi shimon. In essence, the, there's an unstated question of who is the author of our Mishnah? And the Gemara answers, well, I can tell you for sure it's not Rabbi Shimon. That's an assertion statement, but every assertion is in essence just the answer to an unstated question. And finally, um, there are um, focusing phrases. There are phrases that the Gemara throws in as it's going along to help you focus on what you should be thinking about. As an example, the Gemara uses the term Uriminhu. We know that the Gemara is about to bring another halachic statement, and it considers that halachic statement to be a stira to the halachic statement that we are currently um, working on. So as you read along, you can always fit the statement into one of these five types. Second point, to every, every statement in the Gemara refers back to some previous statement, with the exception of halacha, because the initial halachic statement stands on its own. But once we have a halachic statement, it'll be followed by a question. Right? So each question refers back to something else. So if I have a, a halacha, then I'll have a question, and then I'll have an answer to that question, followed by a second question. Now that second question might be challenging the first answer. If it is challenging the first answer, then it's in essence reinstating the first question. Alternatively, the Gemara might accept that answer and present not a second question challenging the answer, but a second question referring back to the, the halacha. Similarly for answers, I can have a halacha, a question, an answer to that question, a second question that challenges the answer, and an second answer that addresses that second question. Or I could have that same setup where the second, second question really um, knocks out that initial answer. And therefore, we're, we're, when we bring a second answer, that is not answering the second question, but referring back to um, the initial question, providing a second answer to that question. These are patterns that occur over and over in the Gemara. And as you're reading along, it's important to follow along to see which statement is referred back to. The third point it, that I'd like to talk about is that there are halachic ramifications to every statement, each one according to its role. For example, if I have a question on the halacha, if it's a stira question, for example, which is probably the most common uh, type of question asked in the Gemara. If I have a stira question, basically that question is challenging the halacha and saying, I disagree with your conclusion. The halachic implication of that question is that given those set of circumstances, the questioner assumes the halacha should be different. Okay, here are the steps that, that are involved in doing uh, reading through the Gemara. The first step is la terra tamishpat. You have to identify the, the statement. Where does it start? Where does it end? Um, and, and how do you translate it? Um, these are skills that are very important to be able to develop on your, for, your own, for yourself, but there are also a ton of resources out there that can help you with this, whether printed resources with um, the Schattenstein Gemaras or the uh, Koran Gemaras, um, whether you're talking about online resources like Sparia or the Merkava, um, there, there are many, many resources out there that can, that can help you with this. 
And as I said uh, last time, one of the things that people find very frustrating is having to um, break their teeth, so to speak, on, uh, on the language. Um, and it's uh, my, my suggestion is definitely to make use of these, uh, these tools that are available and build up your skills as you go along. The second step is what type of statement is this? We said there's, there are five options. So you figure out which one it is. And then to which previous statement is this statement referring? Right, that's what we showed before. The next step is to decide what, what's the logic behind the statement. For example, if I have a question, the question is challenging based on a set of assumptions um, and you need to be able to identify what are those assumptions and what is the challenge being done. And finally, what are the halakhic implications of this statement? When the statement is made, I need to understand, well, this is, this is a question, it's challenging the halakha, or this is an answer, and the answer is providing a defense of the halakha, or reinstating the halakha. Um, we, Nachman and I are uh, working on um, trying to develop a tool or a tool set that will um, be able to capture this process. Um, that's uh, definitely a, a challenge and something that, that we would like to continue. Okay, so that's the end of the, uh, the discussion for now of the uh, reading comprehension skill set. Let's go back to the Gemara. What type of statement is this? If you needed to tell me it's a halacha, question, answer, assertion, um, or a focusing statement, what would you volunteer? Well, I put in punctuation, so you can see that there's a question mark in there. So this is a question. This question says, you're talking about Rishus Harabim? How could it be that you consider that a shogeg? That's a case of mazig. To which pre prior statement is this um, question being addressed? Well, it's being addressed to the statement in the Mishnah, the halachic statement of Hazorik Eben, the Rishus Harabim Baharag, Hareza Gola. And the, the Gemara is challenging that. The Gemara is now saying, that conclusion seems to be wrong. Okay? Feel free to uh, ask questions if there's anything that's unclear as we go along. Okay, so according to this question, while we determined, according to the Mishnah, that the, um, the din type is kasher, it's a kasher hariga, this question challenges that and says, no, the din type should be puzzle in the case of Zorik Eben Lerusha Sarab. So the, 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 um, we go to our, um, our, our representation, our diagram, and according to the question, they, we wanted to say that since you did it, L'chol Adam Acher, it wasn't intentional, it was sufficient to make it kasher, the, um, the, the question denies that. So the Gemara, for the next line in the Gemara is the answer to that question. Amar of Shmuel bar Yitzchak bisoter et kotlo. So Rav Shmuel bar Yitzchak says that the case is talking about when you're knocking down a wall. In essence, Rav Shmuel Bar Yitzchak accepts the, the assumption of the question. The assumption of the question was that if you threw a rock into um, a public domain, that would not be considered Horeg Bishogeg. And therefore, Rav Shmuel Bar Yitzchak is forced to change this, the circumstances of the case. 
Um, so what's the circumstances of the case according to Rav Shmuel Bar Yitzchak? He's saying that I have a wall between my, my property and Rosh Hasharabim, and I'm not throwing rocks into Rosh Hasharabim. I'm knocking down my wall. And the Yerushalmi even goes so far as to say, well, you know, this is a, an old broken down wall. It's about to fall down. It's a dangerous situation. I'm really trying to do a good thing. All I want to do is get rid of this, um, this uh, dangerous wall. And in the course of doing that, one of the rocks, instead of falling into my property, falls out into Rosh Sarabim and unfortunately kills somebody. According to Rav Shmuel Bar Yitzchak, this is the case that the Mishnah says is an example of um, Horeg Bishoge. So Rav Shmuel Bar Yitzchak is answering the Gemara's question and reinstating the halacha with the variation that he is introducing. So if we go back to our representation, we take the, same, the chart that we had before and replace the act of how he, it was done instead of it being Zorek and replace that with Soteret Kotlo, that he was knocking down his wall. Now that we see this, we have to ask the question, well, what difference does it make? What's Rav Shmuel Bar Yitzchak Svara? Why is he saying that this would make a difference? Um, now, there is no clear answer as to why this is true. And um, as opposed to uh, the, the case that we went through in, in the last uh, session, um, where the answers were very clear, here it's up to the learner to um, provide some, you know, their input in, into the process. Um, I can tell you what I think. If anybody has a suggestion as we go along, you're welcome to uh, to chime in. Why, David? Why why didn't the guy knocking on the wall knocking down the wall properly properly uh, mark off or or block passageway to the wall to prevent someone from being killed of a, of a stray rock? That's a wonderful question, Mendel. And that's actually the, the next line in the Gemara coming up. So hold that thought for one minute. Yeah. Um, but just to finish off the thought with Rav Shmuel Bar Yitzchak, Rav Shmuel Bar Yitzchak, just to show you the difference, in Rav Shmuel Bar Yitzchak's case, we have Soteret cut low. And prior to that, we had, oops, well, no, don't want to go back that far. Anyway, prior to that, we had just the case of Zorek. What's the difference between knocking the wall down and throwing the rock? So I'll suggest that when I throw the rock, it's clearly directly, uh, I directly cause the, the person to be killed. However, when I'm knocking down the wall, in essence, I am indirectly causing the person to be killed. Or, to summarize, I will say Rav Shmuel Bar Yitzchak's svara is that if you have grama, an indirect cause, that's sufficient to define you as a horeg bishogeg. Now, the Gemara rejects this. And as Mendel said before, the Gemara objects because Ibaile he should have looked meaning that the, the answer that you gave that he was knocking down his wall is insufficient. This second question is attacking that first answer and saying knocking down his wall is insufficient because he should have taken precautions. He should have checked if there was anybody there, or as Mendel suggested, he should have marked off the, the, the area and not let anybody get in there he didn't do what he needed to do. So the Gemara has a second attempt. Bisoteret katlo balayla. This is a second answer, trying to answer this question of ibaile liyune. He should have checked. So in order to answer that, the Gemara changes 
yet another circumstance. It changes when this case occurred. When we first went through this, we said that the, the Mishnah does not specify when, when the, 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 the uh, manslaughter occurred. This, this answer of the Gemara is saying, well, let's throw that in. Let's make that into a, um, a, a necessary condition. And therefore, this will clear up the, the problem. We will now have a kasher poreg bishogeg. Abba? Uh, yes. Um, it, this might just be my judgment, but to me, it seems like first the Gemara wants to change the condition, and then they find this uh, solution. In other words, I don't think that if you'd look through Shas, you'd find that there's a special case of Soteret Kotlobalayla. It's sort of a made-up case well, that we made up here. Very good. The question that we have to ask is, what does Laila represent? What does nighttime represent? Because you're right, there's no special halachic status to nighttime, at least with regard to, to this. So what we're looking for is how do we generalize nighttime? How do we generalize this input condition to represent something that would, that, that would explain why this is considered a horeg bishoge? People wouldn't, people wouldn't see, even if you had marked it off, people wouldn't see the mark off. It's, it's, it, it, there's no light out. It's hard to see. Very good. It's, it's hard to see. It's hard for me to, um, to take precautions or if I wanted to generalize this, I would describe it as there's limitations to, um, to what you could expect from me. If I, di if, if I didn't have the opportunity to, uh, to, to see anybody there, then we can't hold you responsible for you know, something that you couldn't, couldn't control. That at least is the attempt that the Gemara has in. Yeah, I'm, I'm not buying that one. Okay. <laughs> well, don't take Gemara, don't the, take a wall down at night. The the Gemara agrees with you, Mendel. Good. And Wait a minute! Don't take a walk at night. Don't destroy your wall at night. Exactly. Balayla nami baileliune. Nighttime doesn't get you out of this. You know, Gabriel was right. There's no halachic significance to nighttime. But in addition, what they're trying to do, say is that your attempt to limit negligence based on, oh, it's hard for me, is insufficient. Going back to our, our uh, diagram, we have a third question, which is challenging the second answer. By challenging the second answer, it's reinstating the second question of Ibaile Liyune, that was challenging the answer of Soteret Katlo. That itself was, was trying to address the question of Rishut Harabim Mezidhu, which was challenging the Halacha and the Mishnah. So in essence, this third question has reinstated the very first question and said, we don't understand what case the Mishnah is talking about that would give you a horeg bishoge for throwing a rock. Um, now, as you can see, this, the, the, the shakla vitaria, the back and forth in the Gemara, tends to get, uh, or can get, quite convoluted. And that's one of the difficulties of following along um, with, without some, some kind of uh, uh, a tool that, that will help you follow along. Once you get used to it, you'll, you, you won't need to, to map it out one by one as I'm doing here. It will flow much more naturally. So the Gemara has yet another attempt. Bisoter et kotlo la ashpa. That instead of um, telling you that he is uh, knocking down his wall into Rishus Arabim, he's knocking down his wall into an ashpa. So, just uh, as a as a little piece of background, ashpa in the uh, terminology of the Gemara would probably 
um, map fest onto a junkyard. Um, you know, one person's garbage is another person's treasure. And um, basically it represents some place that people come, come and go from, but they're not there all the time. Now, notice that the, the question of Balaila Nami Ibaile Liyune is not being addressed. The, that question is a knockout punch. You know, trying to change the time and say that it was nighttime didn't work. So when this, this answer is really addressing the second question of how is it that soteric cut low makes enough of a difference to, uh, to define you as a horeg bishoge? Can I ask Let's, you a question? Sure. How do we know which of the assumptions along this path to keep accepting and building on, and how do we know which ones to reject and go back to those earlier answers? So, or earlier uh, questions, I should say. Yes, so that's a very good point. The tool that you have here is basically saying, I'm highlighting for you what's changed. And the, the language of the soteric cut lola ashpa, well, what has changed? Which of the questions of who, how, uh, with what, to whom, where, when, and consequences, which of those has changed? And you can fit it into whichever one makes the most sense to you. Um, I, I put it into where, um, which I think makes sense, but you don't have to. Once you've identified that that's the thing that's changed, you now have to decide, well, why is that a difference that makes a difference? So that's the first step is to take the, the line in the Gemara and say, which of the, the questions is being answered differently? Once you've identified which of them has been answered differently, you need to then ask the question, why does that make, why does that make a difference? What's the logic of the argument once you say so? That's basically so basically, basically, theory could be carrying on here. Silva Sotera Kotlo Balaila Ashva. It might resolve itself further when we see that the Lila part doesn't matter anymore. Um, yes, I I think you can you can get from the text that Balaila Nami Baile Liyune. Um, if it, they intended that there was also Lila in there, it would be the Soteric Kutlo Balaila Lashba. Um, Got it. Okay. But that's, I, I, can hear, I, I can hear your argument, and um, I'm, uh, I, I made the option of reverting when to not being significant. Um, but, you know, that. One of, the, one of the beauties of learning Gemara and what, one of the difficulties as well is that um, things are not necessarily completely clear. So that ambiguity gives you the, the leeway to insert yourself into the process. Okay, so what difference does it make that we're talking about a ashpa? Um, just as, an, as another... Uh, um, historic aside, in addition to being a junkyard, the ashpa also um, was often used as an outhouse. Um, that'll just be uh, a piece of information to know as we get further on in the Gemara. So what's the difference of whether I was knocking down the wall that was between me and Rosh Sarabim or knocking down the wall that was between me and the ashpa? Honestly, I don't know. Um, the Gemara is going to, in the next line, challenge this in the way that anybody would, would challenge. Um, it could be that it's, you know, just a literary device. The Gemara knew that, the, that this was coming up um, and just threw in the, the extra step. Or it could be that there's something um, hidden here that I haven't found. Um, if anybody has a suggestion later on, I'll be happy to hear. But just the fact that I don't have an answer for that 
doesn't necessarily mean that that's a problem. It's something that I need to register as something I don't know. And I can think about coming back to it as I continue learning, or I can go look in the Farshim and try to see if they address this problem. So the Gemara, oops, where am I? Right, so the Gemara objects. And the Gemara says, Hi, Ashba, hechi dami. You're, to, you're telling me that it matters that we're talking about an ashba. What type of ashba are you talking about? The Gemara presents us with two options. You're going to tell me that the difference between an ashba is, and Rashut Harabim is how many people there are? Well, if there aren't people there, then I didn't do anything wrong. Nobody should have been there. The fact that somebody was there is a complete, you know, uh, accident. And if there there are people there, maybe there might be a few less people in Rishusarabim, but there's still a significant amount of people who uh, who use that space. Then you're back to being a poshea. You're you're not a horeg bishogei. Right, so this is a fourth question challenging the third answer, which will percolate back up all the way to challenging the halacha stated in the Mishnah. So the Gemara comes to its final conclusion. Amar Rav Papa, Rav Papa gives us our final answer and it's quite, quite convoluted. We're talking about an ashba, which was used as an outhouse in the nighttime. But people generally don't use it. I guess it's too exposed during the daytime. During the daytime, people don't use it as, as an outhouse. At night, people will use it as an outhouse. But vi'ika de mikre viyativ. Every once in a while, you know, somebody is, uh, you know, really needs, needs to use the facilities. So they'll use this, uh, the, this ashpa as an outhouse even during the day. Poshea lo have. He's not considered a poshea. He didn't do something completely wrong. Deha'ena suya li panot babayom. Because it's not intended, it's, it's not, uh, not likely that uh, this is going to be used during the day. Ones nami lohave daha ika de But it's not a complete accident because there, every once in a while somebody does use this. So in this case, Rav Papa is saying that we, we say it's soteric cut low. We do say that it is or that it's happening during the day, and that we're talking about this convoluted example of an ashpa that is used as an outhouse frequently at night and very infrequently during the day, and therefore this is a uh, case of horeg bishoge. But let me ask you a question. Which previous Question is Rav Papa answering. Papa, could you repeat that? It wasn't clear. Uh, just the connection was a bit poor. Okay. Which previous question was, is Rav Papa answering? We have the original halacha and the Mishnah, the initial uh, objection of Rishut Harabim Mezidhu. We had the second objection, once we turn, turned it into Soteret Kutlo of Ibai Leili Yune, and we had the, uh, the final question of um, if you're talking about an Ashpa, then what difference does it make that it's an Ashpa? So this actually ends up being a Machloket Rishonim. Let's start with Tosvot. 
Tosvot says, Lo tzricha ela. This is on the statement of Rav Papa that um, we're talking about this special Ashba case. Perush demei hashta lo tzarich lo kuma besoter. At this point, we no longer need to be talking about where you're knocking something down. Dehu hadin bizorek mamash. This will be the same halacha even if you throw. According to Tosvot, Rav Papa refers back to the original question. The original question was that Rishud Harabim is mazid, and we went through this whole discussion of, oh, well, maybe it wasn't that you were throwing a rock. It was really that uh, you were knocking down your wall. Tosvot throws out that entire discussion and says, Rav Papa comes and gives you a different, a different suggestion. You threw the rock or knocked down the wall or whatever it was that you did. It doesn't matter what you did, but you did it not into Rishut HaRabim. You did it into the Ashba. If we take our, uh, our, our diagram, our significant input conditions are just where is this happening? This special case of the uh, ashba as a sometimes used uh, outhouse during the day, and the fact that it happened during the day. Okay. According to Tosvot, let's ask the question: What is Tosvot uh, svara? Why are these two uh, p circumstances sufficient to generate a case of Horeg Vishogeg? So for that, we're going to look at the next Tosvot. Tosvot in Dibura Matchil Vashvaha Suya states, Vashta Mairi Bayom Ubizoreg Lashva repeating what we said before. Now we're talking about that it's happening during the day and he's throwing into this special um, ashba, the low the soter cut low, and you don't need to be talking about soteric cut low. V'im tomar. Tosot is asking a question. V'linkot be'ina suyali panot klal v'gam balayla ika de mikre v'yativ u'kidekamar hashta. Tosa would ask the question, why not, why go to this convoluted case? Let's take a simple case. You have a, an ashba, which on only rare occasions is used as, as an outhouse, and therefore it's only on rare occasions that, the, uh, that somebody might be there. And then we don't have to jump around with this type of ashba, or that it's during the day and not at night, or at night, not during the day. Just go for the simple answer. That's Tosot's question. And in his answer, he gives us a, a, a very important uh, underlying concept. V'yesh lomar, the im kain. If we were talking about such a, an ashba, where it's very infrequently used, both by day and by night, anusu, that's an example of onus. Why? The let leila suke adate hu de mikre He didn't have need, it, it should never have dawned on him that somebody might be there. Since people don't use it on, on any type of regular basis. Therefore, aval hashtaba suyali panot balayla, if we do introduce our case where this is an ash, a outhouse that is used frequently at night. It leila suke gam bayom hu de mikre He should have, it should have dawned on him, well, if this is some place that people use regularly at night, then you know what, people might use it during the day. What Tosvot basically gives us is that there are different levels of the potential for, for harm. If you have a, um, a case that is, you know, very rare that something would happen, 
then you're not going to be considered a horeg bishogeg. You're going to be considered a case of onus. If this is an example, if this is a, a case where the likelihood of, of damage happening is uh, beyond some, you know, some, uh, some level, then you're, you're not just a uh, horeg bishogeg, you're a poshea. You would be begeder uh, mezid. And only if you're in that in-between level between um, an ones and the poshea, then you'll be considered a horeg bishogeg. Um, when just, just can, I, a, can I jump in there for one sure. point about the Tosfo then? He is not addressing at all the Gemara's problem of baile li yune. And obviously accepts the premise that you need this convoluted case of the Ashpa with its medium amount of traffic, but not really high traffic. Does that imply that Tosfot would say that if the person went the extra step of looking around, he did the Bailele Yune, that would move him to an Ones as opposed to Shogig? Um, that's, a, that's a very good question. Actually, there's a continuation case in the Mishnah um, where uh, I looked around, there was nobody there, and I threw my rock. And then, in between the time that I let go of the rock, and when it reached its destination, somebody walked into, um, you know, stuck his head out of the window and, and got hit by the rock. Um, so there, there is um, that case discussed in, in, in the Mishnah later on. Um, I think what you're saying is correct, um, but that's not necessarily the focus of this particular case. Um, anyway, just to, to make this um, Tosfot's position a little bit more uh, relevant in, modern, in, a, in a modern setting, um, when they built the, uh, the elementary school uh, near our house um, several years ago, uh, before they opened the, the building for, for the students, they took the parents on a, on a tour through the building. And as we were walking through, we walked up a set of steps and they made a point of saying, oh, according to the tech end, according, according to the, the regulation, the railing on the steps only had to be a certain height. But we built it, the, we, we built the railing to be much higher. Um, using that as, as an example, um, if you, uh, built the building and um, built a railing that was lower than what the what the regulations required, and somebody fell. Well, in that case, you're a poshea. You didn't do what you needed to do. Um, if you built like they did in the elementary school, and they built the uh, the railing to double the height of what's required according to the the regulations, and there was some kid who you know vaulted over and fell, well, you know, they, they went above and beyond, that would be a case of onus. Um, but if you built the wall according to specifications, but didn't go the extra mile, then maybe that would be an example of a horeg bishogeg according to Tosvo. Um, so that's Tosvo's opinion. Let's take a look at Rabbeinu Hanano. Um, he's in very little print on the uh, page, but it's much easier to read with the, with the big print here. Um, and Rabbeinu Hananel states as follows. Hazorik even birushut harabim v'harag ha'vadai mezidhu. If you throw a rock into Rishut harabim and you killed somebody, that is definitely a case where you are considered mezid. The high did nan gole okimna besoteric kotlo. When we talk about a case where you potentially would go to galut, that would only be in a case where you are knocking down the wall. But if you threw a rock, then you would definitely not be a candidate for galut. Yerushalmi kegon shaya kotlo goa. He quotes the Yerushalmi about the, the fact that the wall was, um, was dangerous, it was about to fall down. Um, 
Vika Dimikre Yativ Umichleba. And he accepts Rav Papa's final answer that we're talking about this special Ashpa. And in that case, Poshea Lohave Da Eina Suyali Panot Babayom. He's not considered a Poshea because in general people don't use it during the day. Anusnami Lohave Daha Ikra Demikre Viyativ. But he's also not honest because sometimes people do use it. Lifikach gole. If we diagram Ravenu Hananel, Rav Papa is answering the final question of what type of ashpa, but it accepts all the discussion that happened beforehand. We're talking about soteric kudlo, and we're talking about soteric kudlo to an ashpa. And the type of ashpa is this very special case of ashpa. And now we have the example of um, the, the halacha and the mishnah that um, you would be chayev galut, that you would be considered a horeg vishoge. So if we diagram this, we see that Rabbeinu Hananel requires soteret kutlo. And the, the other conditions that Tosfot also requires. What, what would be the difference between Rabbeinu Hananel's position and Tosfot's position? Could anybody think of a nafkamina between what Rabbeinu Hananel claims and what Tosfot claims? Well, the different, the single difference between the two positions is in the soteric cut low, right? Do I require that it be soteric cut low? The, the nafkamina case would be what happens if somebody throws a rock into this special type of ashpa during the day? According to Tosfot, what would be the din? If somebody threw the rock into this ashpa during the day, so according to Tosfot, the din would be he is a horeg bishogeg, and he would be required to go to galut. According to Rabenu Hananel, what would be the din? Anybody? No. Okay. So the din would be if he threw the rock, he would not be considered a horeg bishogeg, right? That's the statement that mm-hmm. Rabbeinu Hananel said. Hazorek Evan, Birshut Harabim, Vaharag, Ha Vadai Mezidhu. If you threw the rock, it didn't, didn't matter what we were talking about in terms of the place you would be considered mezid. So according to Rabbeinu Hananel, if you threw a rock, you'd be considered mezid. If you're knocking down your wall, and this is the special case of ashpa, then you would not be considered mezid. So what I would claim according to Rabbeinu Hananel is, Rabbeinu Hananel agrees with Tosvot about the levels of of uh, danger, but he throws in something else. If I throw a rock, I'm doing an act that is inherently dangerous. And as an, if it's an act that's inherently dangerous, then you have to accept the consequences for doing something like that. Therefore, if I throw a rock, I no longer have the option of claiming, oh, I was a shogay. Tosvot, on the other hand, ignores how you're doing it. To Tosvot, that's not a relevant uh, piece of the puzzle for deciding whether you are a horeg bishogeg or not. Um, so what I, this is what I would call the, the uh, dangerous act clause, according to Rabbeinu Hananel. To give it a, a, a more modern situation, um, if somebody is, uh, car- carries a gun and um, discharges his weapon, then 
you know, firing your gun is a dangerous act. It doesn't really matter that, oh, I didn't really expect somebody to be there. It's very, it was, you know, very unlikely that somebody would be there. No, you're responsible for taking care of your gun. If you fired your gun, you're responsible for what happens. That would be uh, Rabbeinu Hanano's position. Tosvot, on the other hand, would say, well, let's just look at what was the likelihood of somebody getting hurt by you firing the gun. And if it fell within the, uh, the band between uh, Shia and Ones, you would be considered a Horeg Bishogeg. So taking these two different opinions, um, we see that um, they have very different understandings of what the conclusion of the Gemara is. I'd like to cover one last um, opinion, and that's the Rambam. Um, as we said last time, the Rambam writes a book of statutory law. Um, the beginning of uh, the sixth parak of Hilchot Rotzea Hushmirat Nefesh, um, the Rambam lays out for us the different types of Horgim below kavana, shoshahem ha'horgim below kavana, yesh horeg bishkaga v'halama gmura. If you did it bishogeg with a complete um, lack of intention, v'zehu shenemar bo v'asher lo tzada, v'dino shi'igle la'arei miklat v'inatzel k'mo shebe'arnu. The din of that person is that he should go to ir miklat. That's the case where you do go to Galut. V'yesh horeg v'tiyya ashkaga karov la'ones. There's a, an alternate case where you killed somebody v'shogeg, but it was um, very, very close to be, being completely uh, accidental. V'hu she ye'era v'mitat ze me'ora pele she'ino matsui b'rov me'oraot v'nei adam the uh, Rambam's uh, definition of, of ones is uh, quite a high bar. This is completely unexpected. Um, it's uh, almost unheard of. But if that's the case, dino shahu patur min galut. He does not go to galut. Vim harago goel hadam ne'ragalav. And he is completely covered. Um, the goel hadam does not have the right to kill him at all. And the final category is v'yesh horeg bishkaga, v'tiyesh kaga krova lezadon. This is a case where <coughs> um, what you did is bordering on mezid, v'hu shiye badavar kemo pshia. And that's something that had negligence involved. Osha yalo li zahir v'lo nizhar. Or he should have um, been more careful than he was. V'dino she'eno goleh v'vnei she'avono chamur e'en galut mechaperet lo v'ein arei miklat koltot oto she'enan koltot ela mechuyav galut bilvad. This guy, he doesn't have the right to go to galut. The arei miklat don't, aren't willing to accept such a person. Such a person is a poshea and lefikach im mitzao goel hadam b'chol makom v'arago patur. Now the Rambam has set up for us our three categories. There's horeg b'shogeg that goes to galut. There is horeg b'shogeg, which is karov laones, who does not go to galut and is completely covered. And there's horeg b'shogeg, that's karov lemezid. He does not go to galut either, but he doesn't go to galut because we don't let him go to galut and the Goel Hadam has the right to kill him. In Halacha Vav, the Rambam starts giving us the examples that flesh out the, uh, the statutes. Ketzad. Hazorek even l'rishut harabim v'harga. O hasoter katlo l'rishut harabim v'nafla even v'hemita. Whether you did zorek or whether you were soter, you're, you were knocking down your wall. If you did that into Rishud Harabim, Bain Shestaro Bayom, Ubain Shestaro Balayla, regardless of the time, whether it was day or night, 
This is a case that is karov lemezid ve'inon niklat. He cannot go to ir miklat mipnei shazop shiuti. It's his negligence. Sharei haya lo la'ayin va'achar kach yizrok o yistor. Because he should have looked, he should have um, checked before he did these actions, and um, since he didn't, he is considered a poshea. What is the Rambam's take on our case? So, if we're talking about Rishud Harabim, right? The Rambam's this, this discussion in Halacha Vav is about Rishud Harabim. He says it doesn't matter when it happened, neither day nor night, and it doesn't matter how you did it, whether you threw the rock um, or knocked down a wall, in all cases, this is not considered horeg bishogeg, which seems to go against what we just read in in our uh, uh, in our Gemara, because there should be a case in which um, I do go to Galut, and there is the Rambam. We'll get to that in a minute, but the to me the overriding concern with regard to the Rambam is that. We're talking about Rishut Harabim. Anytime you're doing an act in a public domain, you are responsible. You cannot claim any type of shogeg when you're acting out in public. If you're doing something it, that's not a public space, maybe the dalacha will be different. But according to the Rambam, there is an achrayut of what you do in public. And what you do in public you are responsible for. If anything goes wrong, then you are considered a, a posha. Let's continue on with the Rambam. In Halacha Vav, the Rambam says, Ketzad, what's the example of um, uh, the next example? Hazarek Even Lerishud Harabim Vaharga. Oh, I'm sorry. We read that already. Sorry, I meant halacha zayin. Continuing the examples. Staro la'ashba balayla. If I knocked down my wall at, at night to an ashba, im harabim mitsuyin ba hareze karov lemezid ve no niklat. Ve im ein harabim mitsuyin ba klal, According to Halacha Zayin, if I knock down my wall, not to Rishud Harabim, because if it's in Rishud Harabim, there's nothing to talk about. But we're talking about now into an Ashba. And I did it at night, then it depends. Here we have Tosvot's um, distinction in terms of the likelihood of danger. If their people are, are, uh, are there, then that's karov lemezid, and you are considered poshea. If ein rabim mitsuyin baklal, it's people are not there at all, then it's karov leones, and you are patur from galut. And the final um, the final halacha, the Rambam says, "Haita hashpa asuyali panot ba balayla veina asuyali panot ba bayom v'nikra adam v'yashav sham v'nafla alav even b'shad stira umeit hareze gole." Finally, the Rambam has art, the case that Rav Papa has, where we're talking about this special ashpa, and you're talking about soteric cut low, and he dies, then, and only then, will the Rambam say that you are gole. So according to the Rambam, the only case that we're talking about is, you're talking about soteric cut low, you're talking about this special ashba, it happened during the day, in that case, the Rambam agrees that it is a, a case of Horeg Bishogeg. In essence, the Rambam ad, uh, adopts Rabbeinu Hananel, 
right? Because he requires that we be talking about Soteric Kutlo, or at least he seems to. The Rambam adopts Tosvot's position with regard to the likelihood of, of something bad happening. And the Rambam adds the, the addition of the Rishud Harabim being an overriding concern. Okay, we've been through uh, quite a bit and uh, actually um, uh, gone over our time. So I'd just like to sum up. Um, the answers to the questions that we listed of uh, who, where, when, etc., will change our understanding of the halacha. When you generalize those um, those particular um, uh, details into what they represent, you'll generate completely different um, uh, svarot, completely different statutes that are uh, presented in a given case. Um, we can understand the, the, the flow of the Gemara, the text of the Gemara in different ways. As we saw, Tosfot understands Rav Papa as referring back to an earlier question. Rabbeinu Hananel disagrees. And that brings us to two completely different understandings of, of the halacha. Um, and finally, choosing which of these, the input conditions are the ones that are relevant, the ones that are generating the halacha, will bring us to different shitot, as we saw, um, Tosvot claimed that uh, how you do it is irrelevant. Rabbeinu Hananel claimed that how you do, did it is relevant. The Rambam claimed that where you did it is, um, is an overriding uh, concern, etc. That gave us um, completely different understandings. So um, I just want to thank you very much. I hope that things were um, relatively clear. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them.